Hello, everyone, and a warm welcome to my session, Handling Secrets in the Release Process with Azure DevOps and Azure. Um, for those who don't know me, a uh, quick intro from my side. My name is Mark Miller. I'm working as a consultant at Cortecture in Switzerland. We are focusing on consulting services all around DevOps, enterprise application, architecture, and of course, Azure. We also have two products, um, an OpenID Connect Identity Provider, as well as application to build enterprise applications with .NET. So today, it's all about deploying something to Azure with Azure DevOps and handling secrets correctly. So what are we going to do? So first of all, a sneak peek, what we are talking about. I've got this small Hello World application. This obviously runs in Azure. Um, we are doing some things you should never do. Uh, it's displaying secrets, but it's just for demo purposes. So we are going to have some secrets in our application. We are accessing other resources like uh, storage, uh, block storage, reading out files, and obviously we need to authenticate everything. We need to authenticate our DevOps agents to deploy to Azure. We need to authenticate the applications towards the other services like Keyboard, like block storage, etc. So um, we have a couple of pipelines ready, and those pipelines are just building applications and are deploying it. And at the end of the day, we want to know how to do it the right way with Azure DevOps. So this is our agenda. Um, a quick introduction to the whole setup, the whole environment, and then we are diving in into the Azure pipelines, how do we deal with secrets there? How do I define and access secret variables? How do I um, access other services like um, uh, Azure APIs for ARM deployments, etc.? Then we are moving over to some uh, application specifics like how uh, we store our secrets. There we have Azure key holds. We're talking a little bit about test application, and last but not least, the passwordless way to go about manage identities. So yeah, let's get it started. Um, let's have a quick intro. So it is very important to see where we are heading at and what actually is meant by the DevOps solution. So um, actually, if you're talking about DevOps, uh, Microsoft, yeah, course, Azure DevOps is, is the tool to go. Now we have GitHub as well, which integrates. But actually, the DevOps tooling goes way far beyond those um, clear defined products. So what we know is Azure DevOps is offering some, some services for planning of our work. We have um, a service Azure repos to store our code. We have Azure pipelines to implement the whole automation, which is mainly uh, continuous integration between this delivery you're implementing with that. You have also Azure artifacts in the DevOps solution to store our packages, like the packages, NPM packages, etc. And then we also have test plans, as we know, um, applications should be tested as well. But the story is not over here. So it's just a couple of puzzle pieces in, in this whole ecosystem. And if you're talking about the DevOps solutions, of Microsoft, it goes for beyond the product, uh, the product in Azure DevOps. So for example, we have a couple of other services which are not direct in the product Azure DevOps, but is in the Azure ecosystem. All these things, Azure Monitor, we use Azure Kubernetes services for our deployments and so on, and as well Azure Keyboard, Keyboard on the lower right. So if you're planning a solution with Azure DevOps, it doesn't mean we stop at the boundaries of the product Azure DevOps, normally we stop at the boundary of the whole Azure ecosystem, which also includes Azure DevOps and stuff like this. Okay, so let's have a look on a, a traditional application. So if we deploy our infrastructure as well as our apps, what do we have to deal with? So normally we have the application code, um, your source code, which means compiled. We have some infrastructure definition, um, some infrastructure as code, hopefully, to define our infrastructure and to roll it out. 
flower market environment. Um, then, uh, if we have an Azure solution, we of course deploy to Azure, so we can create Azure resources and deploy our software there. So, all aspects of Azure DevOps are now, for, um, let's do an overlay of all those features. So, we need something to version and branch our application code and infrastructure code. Um, we need um, some execution logic to compile, to package our application as well as execution logic to deploy to our Azure resources. Um, in there, uh, this is mainly Azure pipelines. We have tasks, we have stages, we have variables and secrets, um, for sure. We also have um, the pipeline infrastructure itself. So the agents actually executing the whole thing. Where do they live? What is the security there? Um, we have templates. Uh, we have we are able to establish an execution directly in the target, for example, it's a VM and place our deployment agents directly there for better security. Um, we deal with approval, with automated checks, etc. cetera. Um, uh, we put around different deployment strategies and as well do some test automations directly on our target resources. So if we see um, what we are using, therefore, it's obviously as a repos for the code storage, then mainly Azure pipelines to um, compile and deploy our applications. We may have Azure artifacts in place. And whenever we need something which is considered a secret, we normally tend to use or tend to integrate Azure Kubo or use pipeline secrets, as well as the service connections offered by Azure DevOps to store, for example, the connectivity towards Azure Arm. Okay, um, so we also have the possibility to use agents which are hosted by Microsoft. So those are VMs running by Microsoft. From a security perspective, they are always destroyed after a job has been run. So we never get a reuse VM, etc. So it, uh, it's made sure that nothing can be because there was something in memory or some temporary files were written. And yeah, we have the environment uh, topics, so we can also organize our deployment targets as logical environments, can add checks and approvals to have a manual um, uh, logic there to easily approve it and make sure that works well. Okay, so what do we do if we deploy some applications uh, to Azure? So first of all, um, we normally deploy one or many resource groups in Azure, and Azure is backed up by Azure AD. So whenever we do something, it doesn't necessarily have to be Azure DevOps, but we are talking today about Azure DevOps, so this is why it's there. So we need to bring the applications um, where the code lives in Azure DevOps as well as the pipelines run within Azure DevOps to this Azure environment. So first of all, we need to authenticate the whole thing towards um, Azure. And there we have an option for service connections in Azure DevOps, which is mainly a secure storage to store all kinds of authentication um, details towards any service. So in this case, it's Azure. It could be a container registry. It could be an NPM registry um, whatsoever. We will see it in what we can find. So whenever we need to access an external service, normally we store those credentials securely in the service connection. Then when we want to build or deploy our uh, software, we are running a pipeline inside that agent pool. So we have a logical definition of our agents, could be private agents, we host them, could be host agents, Microsoft so VMs. And we have a definition of where to run which pipeline in. So if this pipeline is now running, we are running a job always on so-called agent. So a pipeline may consist of one or many jobs, and the job is always executed on a single agent. So during runtime, this agent needs security stuff. If the agent needs to know how to authenticate towards Azure and so on. So what happens actually during runtime, the Azure gets the details of the reference service connections, gets the secret variables we, we, we defined earlier, and those are present or available during runtime at the agent itself. They are stored in a so-called vault in inside the agent, and the agent might use them to actually execute some code. 
Um, so whatever we do then in our pipeline, so for example, you're executing um, ARM, BICEP, um, you'll be executing HCI, CLI, Terraform, whatsoever. And we are creating those resource groups inside our part environment. So this is where the age needs uh, security. But often, um, or if you have an ideal solution, we do not need a lot more than that. We just initially deploy those um, uh, uh, objects uh, to the Azure environment. And then within our deployment logic, we build up uh, other I, 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 security identities, like managed identities, for example, we build up a key vault to directly store some secret within the infrastructure deployment inside the key vaults, the apps can access the key vault, et cetera, and so on. We could also directly deploy an agent inside our Azure infrastructure, so for example, like could um, um, have a Prometheus cluster and run some agents inside this cluster, so the communication is no more from the outside to the inside. The agent always connects from the agent to Azure DevOps. So I, I could have private endpoints whatsoever because I'm running the agents inside my target environment. Okay, so uh, what are the best practices? How do we do that? Um, so normally we distinguish between different kinds of pipelines. So normally we have such kind of based infrastructure pipeline, which is really deploying the infrastructure. So the real infrastructure is for like setting up a Kubernetes uh, cluster, um, setting up the, the, the virtual networks, database service, and so on. So not application specific, but more like general infrastructure. There we use the templates uh, functionality to, to do a compete ourselves uh, for the definitions and so on. Then from an application perspective, we normally have a CI pipeline which builds the application, creates artifacts, and then um, goes over triggering a CD pipeline to continuous delivery of continuous deployment pipeline, which is actually executing the deployment tasks for our, for our environment. Okay, so um, long story short, what we are talking about are those secret providers. So in all those parts where we are executing something, uh, there we have a secret provider by uh, defining secret variables, variable groups, key vault integrations, managed identity, and so on and so on. So let's get started. Um, so the secret handling in general, um, uh, the secret handling in general um, is um, what we need to know is that. We are now focusing as a, on, a, on a configuration as code. So all our pipelines are implemented um, in YAML pipelines, so this is just plain text stored in uh, Git repository. And um, there we have some some caveats or some parts we need to pay attention. So since everything is plain text in our configuration as code, uh, the problem is if we would put some secrets in there, it is in the Git history. The Git is also indexed with a search index uh, in, in Azure DevOps, so you can just search for some parts so our secrets would just be publicly available for everyone and access to our Git repositories. Um, uh, in general, um, the code never should, should contain any secrets. We normally also have some pipelines available which check for that if anyone commits something which is considered a secret or request is not allowed to be um, merged. Okay, um, let me see. I got a notice that I have got some background noises. Shouldn't be there. Hopefully it is going to be better. Um, let me quickly check that. Oh, yeah, I think we again got a microphone uh, problem. Um, let me check if we can solve that.
I'm really sorry. It looks like uh, we have a problem that you know, my headset microphone is, is running and I cannot change it anymore. Let's quickly try to put this microphone near to me. Um, hopefully it is, it is still okay. Okay, I'm really sorry for that. Um, whatever this, this is happening. Okay, so let's continue. Please tell me if there's again a problem with the sound. So um, then um, you also need to, to handle the secrets towards the infrastructure changes. So changing the application might, might need new secrets. So normally that, that secret should always be part of the application pipelines and never be part of a generic um, a, a secret definition which gets rolled out. Okay. And then we can also distinguish between, between secret usage and secret management. Uh, this means that somebody who is just using a pipeline or executing a pipeline doesn't necessarily need to have access to the real secret information. Uh, this person just needs to be able to trigger the pipeline and technically the technical users are able to read the secrets, but not the user executing the pipeline. Whereas a secret administrator actually can manage the, the secrets and therefore has access to them. Okay, so um, if you have a look at the, the, the whole ecosystem of Azure DevOps, um, where to put the secrets or where is it safe and where not. Um, putting it inside the YAML file is a no-go because it's plain text, um, this is pretty clear. So we can place secrets outside the YAML file in the pipeline definition, define a secret variables, those are safe, but rather hard to maintain. And um, we can also have variable groups. So these variable groups are separated from the pipeline and we're just referencing them. And then you also have the service connections available um, where we could access services like Azure and so on. So a very cool feature of Azure DevOps is that we could logically work with the variable groups, but not using Azure DevOps as a secret storage. So we are using Azure Key Vault for that with a very tight integration into the ecosystem of variable groups. So it looks like it's a normal variable, but actually the value is always um, um, read, read from the Key Vault in Azure. So on the agent itself, while well, there is a yellow uh, lock uh, there on the runtime for sure, Every runtime process executing something which needs secrets, well, they're in the memory at least, we have secrets available. So they do a lot on the agent itself that, that uh, the, uh, those secrets are stored in the internal wall, etc. That it is not that easy to access them, but again, it's runtime and the agent has access to them. So if I got an error prone script or if I'm, I'm, I'm willingly uh, trying to, to read them and, and present them everywhere, anywhere, um, it is theoretically possible. But this is why we're also doing some um, some uh, reviews of the pipelines as well. Um, then the logging, this is uh, considered as safe. So if you make a mistake and you print out a secret variable, nothing happens. So the agent logger is um, detecting that and is just replacing it by star, star, star in your log file. So whatever you print out to the command line and print execution, it is safe and never ever be available in the log files. Okay, and for sure uh, with application, we can also access the key role, um, as well using managed identity directly. So we do not have to deal with credentials actually uh, during the deployment. Okay, so um, let's have a quick look at the secret variables and the variable groups. So um, it is important to see that all those variable stuff which needs to be secret is not managed in YAML at all. And um, it, it is just injected uh, basically um, into the runtime, but not by default as environment variables. You can see that mint. Okay, so let's have a quick demo here to see uh, how that works. Um, let's go quickly to a pipeline, edit this one. So here we see a YAML pipeline. You also see here the variable section. As you can see, it's plain text, it's source code indexed, uh, et cetera. Um, so um, 
that there is no place for sequence. There is this uh, fancy button over here, which is called variables. And here, you need to think about the pipeline is, is added to the database or referenced in the database. So there is a pipeline uh, record. And if those variables are stored securely in the database, and as you can see, I can define secret variables here, but it is not that obvious that those exist. But um, if it's secure to place them, it's just more or less a maintenance uh, issue. So if we run this um, pipeline, let me put it over there, and um, if, or if we want to edit those, those variables, we can simply do so by using the normal variable syntax. So one thing we need to know is that if I'm using variables like here, secret variable 01, I can do so because here this means it's like a templating engine. Um, this script is rendered before it gets executed. So my variable is inserted into the script. And whereas if I want to use environment variables, in general, all the environment variables or all the variables are available as environment variables in a pipeline, not for secure variables. So if I want to have them available as environment variable, I need to explicitly map those um, here to make sure only those secret variables I want to are available as environment variable. So this is just a security restriction that you can't run a script. So just uh, export all uh, environment variables and you have access to those secrets. Okay, so the next step would be a better maintainability. Um, so we can use a library. So inside a library, those are variable groups, and we can just here have an arbitrary uh, set of variables, and we can manage them as well as defining them as secret variables. So you just have to activate the lock. They are stored securely. You can't, you can never access them again here in this UI. So once stored, they are gone and then you can just use them in your, um, in your pipeline. So the cool thing here is um, if I have a variable group, I can go and say, well, just authorize this variable group to um, work with the key vault. So this is an Azure key vault, and then I got all the secrets available from this key vault, and I can select what secrets from this specific key vault I want to use inside every DevOps. So I just uh, select them and add them to this variable group. So again, in this case, they're not stored in the variable group, it's just a link. And then during runtime, they're downloaded from the key vault uh, to, to my um, execution environment of pipelines, and then I can access them easily. So um, let's see how we do that. So if I go, a couple of variable groups. It is as simple as that. I still have the variable section, but then I'm referencing them by the group uh, name. So I can just uh, reference them into my plain text YAML and then I have access to it. And this is definitely the preferred solution because it's better or easier to maintain uh, those variables and secrets in a separate group than in this hidden variable section specifically for this particular uh, pipeline. Okay, so um, we've seen the variables and variable groups, and now uh, a few words on the service connection. So whenever we need to talk to another service like Azure itself, we can create a service connection inside Azure DevOps. So it connects to external or remote services to execute any task towards them. So whenever we have a task in a pipeline, normally the built-in tasks which are able to communicate to Azure, to a Kubernetes cluster, to a database whatsoever, they offer a reference to such kind of um, uh, service function. So in the code again, and just selecting this um, the service connection is just a reference in the pipeline. It could be a different security. So it could be that I'm only allowed to see this service connection in the drop down menu when I'm defining a pipeline, but I'm not able to manage that one. So again, it's a two step security the users of those service connections and the managers uh, of those service connections. 
So, um, yeah, everything's set here. Good. Um, so there is a lot of uh, different types of support that we will see in a, in a minute in, in, the, in the demo. Let's do that. So let's go again to Azure DevOps. And we can see that if we go to our settings menu, we have here uh, for in the pipeline section, we have a service connections menu. And here I'm able to create those kind of service connections. So we see we have the Azure um, connection types, we can uh, Docker host, Docker registry. We also have the uh, possibility to define a generic service connection. So any arbitrary username and password can be stored, GitHub integration, uh, Jenkins, Kubernetes, Maven, and so on and so on. So there is really a big feature set. You can also implement your own type of service connection so it's extendable. So if you write a custom extension for every DevOps, you can provide whatever service connection type you'd like. So the cool thing is it has a very tight integration. So if we choose, for example, here as a resource manager, um, you have an automatic a service principle uh, mode where we just need to click next. You just choose our subscriptions and then a service principle is created in Azure for us. So we might uh, need to enter our password again and then a service principle is created. So I've got a dedicated identity inside Azure for this Azure DevOps environment. And I can place the, the appropriate permissions to this identity in Azure, this service principle. And I can also um, um, filter some resource groups here to make sure this service connection can only um, access a specific resource group. For example, I can have different service connections for development, testing, and production. So also what you see here, the security grant access to permission to all pipelines, it's a setting that you should never actually activate because every usage of um, a service connection should be uh, specifically allowed that no, not anyone else could just create a new pipeline and access whatever your production subscription. You can also um, see the, those links very easily. So if you click here on manage principle, you're directly redirected to Azure, to the service principle. So here you see uh, the service principle, you can add it to uh, specific roles in Azure, you can add it uh, to, to uh, specific groups and so on and so on. So this is the way to go for the majority of tasks and pipelines, always create a service connection and authorize it. So um, you also have a user history. So we see what happened, which, which pipeline did access those um, uh, service connections. So you can also prove that nothing is going wrong or you could see what was going wrong if something happened, which shouldn't happen. Let's get those screen dots. Um, so uh, the next thing is the key vault itself. Um, so the key vault is a secret management solution for um, of, of Azure. So I can place any arbitrary um, secrets in there and read them, update them, etc. And um, there is also a key management solution built in. So if I have any encryption keys, um, I need, I can store them there, uh, there as well. And I can also manage certificates inside the key. So this is definitely the preferred option. If you have to manage any kinds of secrets, put it in the key vault. We've seen we can easily integrate them uh, within the, the, the groups. You can access it. So if you want to have a good solution, you, sh you should actually use the key vault to store your secrets. There are also different types of key vaults. So there is the the cheaper one, which is software encrypted, and there is also hardware encrypted key vaults available. It just pay a little bit higher uh, fee for it. So um, it is a very good solution to have a centralized application secret store. So you know where the secrets are. They are not distributed all over in the pipelines there and there. So you really have a centralized solution. There is nothing outside where those secrets are stored, you're also normally trying to integrate it directly into the application so that you really have no other touching points for it. Um, 
cool thing is it's fully integrated in Azure Active Directory. So um, we can have role-based security, we could use uh, managed identities to access those secrets. And uh, we can also define access policies for those identities to say which user has which access, so if anyone can only read or write or whatsoever. So, and yeah, we can monitor and uh, uh, access and use of those secrets, and it is more or less integrated with, uh, within most of the services, so it's a really cool feature to do the right way. So, um, what do we do when we need to access those secrets from the application? I mean, if I have the possibility to directly read uh, those secrets uh, from my application, I would do so rather than reading them out in my agent, then putting in uh, into a configuration file of my application and then rolling that out. So the goal is actually to really have them inside um, your application, so a direct access from application to the keyboard. And therefore, we normally use a managed identity. So within Azure, we can run any application as uh, with a managed identity, and we are just going to authenticate this application for that keyboard access, and you don't have to type in any passwords. Again, if this is not possible, we can also use certificates for authentication, um, uh, but normally if you're inside Azure, the managed identity approach is the one to go. It works even though with Azure Kubernetes service, so you can run every single pod as a different uh, identity uh, to have a very uh, strict access policy. So normally I, I got asked, um, how many keyboards do we need? We told about that there is a central storage, so we build a central keyboard. No, this is not the right choice. It's also um, 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 described by Microsoft in the documentation. You should use specific keyboard instances by per app per stage. So if I have an application A in stage testing, I have a keyboard for A testing. Then I have a keyboard for A prod, etc. So this is the goal, so you should rather have many small keyboards instead of a big one. Also, uh, if you do not do that, you end up having different keys. So you would have the database connection string dash dev, database connection string dash production and so on. And this is really cumbersome to work with. So it's better to just choose another connectivity, choose another keyboard and use the same keys to read out those credentials and um, throughout all your stages instead of having this big single keyboard. Okay, so um, how does a keyboard look like? Uh, just checking the time, we've got 10 uh, minutes left. Let's quickly have a look. So what I did is I created this Azure environment. So here we have the, um, our resource group and inside the resource group, I placed this keyboard. So inside a keyboard, as you might uh, guess, there are secrets. So we have this secret we've seen in this uh, demo application. And I can also have a look at this one in the current version. I can also say, uh, show it to me. So this is our top secret secret you all know now. And this is how those secrets work. So I can place a secret and every time I'm changing it, there is a new revision being created. So from the access policy, it is, um, those um, definitions like here. So what we see here, we have different permissions like this demo user um, has only get and list, so it's read only user, the user whereas I have the full flexibility, the full access to those secrets. And what we see here is we have the secrets demo web app and as well our Azure DevOps instance. This is why uh, or how I could access it with my um, variables to group and my application should directly uh, be able to access it. And here, um, this is the managed identity of this application being um, in the access policies that that is working. So how did I do that? Well, I did it directly by setting it up. So um, the whole um, infrastructure is defined in two bicep files. So this is mainly setting up this uh, key role and, and uh, setting some initial reader policies and admin policies, etc. But here, the application, when I'm deploying the application here, I'm just creating a new access policies and I'm inserting the identity, the principal ID directly into those access policies. 
So the cool thing here is I do not need to touch anything. So my pipeline just executes this bicep file. I then do not need to touch everything, anything. It's just Azure doing uh, the security on its own. And this is definitely the preferred way to go. Okay, so let's see. Um, we've seen those demos. Let me quickly um, see what we did. Yeah, and if I want to access, I'm doing this quickly on a on a screen uh, shot uh, rather than the demo. You're otherwise running out of time. So if I need to access those secrets from my application, I I can do so. For example, here in .NET. I could just create a secrets client here. So here we see a secrets client. I'm pointing it to this keyboard name, which is coming from the settings. Remember, we have a keyboard for dev, test, and prop. So I'm storing that in my settings file. And I'm authenticating myself via this managed identity feature. So I'm using this default Azure credentials, which is authenticating the application on its own. OK. And then I'm just adding this Azure keyboard to my configuration. And when this is done, I can just access those secrets via the configuration object. And here we see, hey, configuration, the secret, this is what you've seen at the beginning. Okay, so now uh, let's talk about a couple of things. Those are the basics, uh, those are technical solutions. And now let's have a couple of more concepts towards the end. So one thing is password rotation. Um, what does it mean? So if we have a managed identity solution, it's even better because we do not have the problem of passwords, of storing them, of, of, of changing them. But if we don't have a solution like this, we need to, to keep track of those uh, passwords. So even if the passwords are stored securely, it might be that they're leaking. It might be um, that somebody else would have, ac have had access to it. And if we don't change them forever, well, there is a, a big security problem. So we should change those passwords frequently. Um, so um, with this, we limit the breach and um, we are adding an additional expiry. So teams often in, 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 in demo processes do a rotation of those passwords on every deployment. So really every deployment which is executed changes the passwords and uses the new passwords uh, during runtime. And, and this means if you deploy it three times a day, um, there is not a long validity of those passwords. So if they leak, um, it is not that critical as you would use the same password over and over for many years. The only problem is if you do a rotation, you have a problem in zero downtime uh, scenarios. So if I change the password, there might be a problem that um, I, I currently have a failure because the service is not available because it changed and my application hasn't been updated. So normally it's a very easy solution. You normally store two um, passwords or use two passwords or two tokens. So a lot of Azure services uh, also use that uh, principle that you can read in one key and then use the other. So you still have a valid solution. Um, for a zero downtime uh, uh, deployment approach or a zero downtime password change approach. So um, we have two update strategies in this. So either um, uh, we do it with the second one and, and change it, or we have a credential store like Keyball, and you're just updating the new uh, password inside the Keyball, and then you're propagating this Keyball change to the application. So let's have a quick look how we do that. So um, one option would be we have two passwords and two keys, and every time we are deploying the password, we are changing the active one to the to the to the other one. So we are deploying the next of the application, so we can read the other one, um, and so on and so on. So um, we always have two valid passwords. So in this short period of time, where two application two application versions are still deployed in zero downtime scenario. Those are valid, and then we uh, change it that only password two is uh, um, um, uh, there, and password one would be changed. The other solution would be we do the same thing. We also store a, a pair of passwords. We do the same swapping or um, um, updating mechanism, but we use a configuration provider in between, and this could be um, also um, uh, the, the keyboard of Azure. So um, we 
only read this single secret from the key vault in our application. So if we do an update, we are just updating this password configuration so we could update the, the key vault itself. And then the application just reads a new value from it and um, there is a little bit less logic on the application. So both uh, uh, ways of uh, possible are good and uh, it's your uh, process which defines which one you should use. For the latter, how do we do that? I quickly show it in a screenshot. Um, so if we use Azure Key Vault, um, for example, we can add here a reload interval. So here, every 15 minutes, we are reading those secrets again. And uh, so we have a very updated configuration object inside our application. The problem now is, well, what if you just reload the whole thing and you change the password, you have an error for 15 minutes, right? right? No, we, we can work with that. So one solution could be that we are doing a little bit of a retry mechanism. I mean, this is just a, a sample. You could uh, extract those retry mechanisms in the library, etc. But the goal is the following. So here we have a connection string for the blob storage, and it's just a sample. You could also manage that entities for the blob storage. And if there is a problem with the connectivity, we catch this exception, and then what's possible with the configuration um, environment in, in .NET is you can trigger a reload. So I'm actively reloading the secrets from the key vault and then go in the next retry loop. And then normally the right secrets should have been loaded and we can try it again and it will be successful. So we can also combine that logic if you only want to store a single, a single password in your key vault but have this rotation outside, this still works. It just needs to be to have a little bit of a retry logic there. Okay, last but not least, uh, managed identities. Uh, we heard about it. Um, so managed identities are the way to go because I'm actually password less uh, with managed identities. So uh, the system services get a managed identity are automatically associated or I can create manually managed um, uh, identities. So there is no credentials I have to deal with. There are no credentials which are accessible because it's internal to Azure. And uh, yeah, well, uh, we have two types um, of, of managed identities, the system assigned managed identities. They are tightly coupled to the resource. If I create a web app, as long as the web app lives, I've got this managed identity. Um, if I delete the, man uh, the web application, this managed identity also gets to me. And I could also use a user assigned managed identity. So I'm creating this managed identity and I'm associating it to a service. This means this um, and uh, managed identity, sorry, um, is living uh, my life cycle, not the resources life cycle. So um, uh, it is my decision which one to use if it should be tightly coupled to the lifetime of the resource or not. Okay, um, managed identities are available almost everywhere in Azure. Um, so you normally, if you have two Azure services which need to authenticate, against each other, um, this is the way to go and uh, the list is getting lower and lower. So always try to check if this is working. Um, quick uh, note here. Um, so we see here we have this default Azure credentials. This is a helper to get this managed identity of the actual execution context. And what about development? I heard a lot of, well, but now I'm local and what do I do? I need to change my code. No, you don't. You just keep your code as is and use this built-in Visual Studio functionality. You have an account selection for Azure Service Authentication. You can choose any AAV account here. You need to authenticate yourself. And then this token interceptor, for which is also used by managed identity solutions, is used here with that defined user. So you just press F5 and all the Azure connectivity is authenticated or the token is created with that user. So you don't need to change the code, you don't need to have two configurations, you just use this default credential setting, whereas it is a managed identity during runtime or your personal account during development time. Okay, so we've uh, seen that one. Um, so this is just a, a UI, I, I showed you the bicep and uh, of course in the management UI, you can also select this identity you, for example, here can choose 
if it's a system I uh, assign an entity or a user assign one. Okay, and yeah, there it is. You already see that in the previous demo. Okay, so I'm running a little bit out of time. I'm sorry for that, but um, yeah, if there is any question, I haven't seen any um, in, in the chat for now. I'm still here a little bit. Just ping me, contact me um, on Twitter, um, write me an email whatsoever. So a big thank you for being here. A big thank you to organizers. I could be here. And yeah, enjoy the next session as well. And have a nice day. Bye, everyone.